IQ test is a relatively recent invention of the last hundred years, but that did not stop scientists from finding other ways to measure intelligence. Skull size, skin pigment, uh, angle of the face. They didn't just argue over intelligence either. Morality, sexual perversion, mental illness were all explored with the most dubious of measurements under the guise of science. Essentially what we have when we look back is one constant. Blacks are inferior to whites. The only thing that has changed is the way they justify this conclusion. The most, most popular method now is the IQ test. To put IQ in perspective, consider the following. When asked to rank personal qualities in order of desirability, people put intelligence second only to good health. An important question to address then is, what is IQ? Now, I'm going to assume that everyone watching this knows what an IQ test is. If not, I have a a lot of links in the sidebar that discuss this in more detail, but essentially the idea is that an IQ test is measuring our intelligence. That is, the IQ test is based on an assumption that intelligence, an abstract and nebulous concept at best, is a single identity, its location within the brain, and its quantification is one number for each individual, and the use of these numbers to rank people in a single series of worthiness. Think about intelligence for a minute, and all the various expressions linguistic intelligence, logical mathematical intelligence, musical intelligence, bodily intelligence, spatial intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, and intrapersonal intelligence. And doesn't it seem a bit curious to you that this wide range of abilities can be summed up by a single number? To the phrenologist of a century ago who read each bump and knob on a skull as a measure of domesticity, emotiveness, or sublimity, or causality, the phrenologist divided mental function into rich congeries of largely independent attributes. With such a view, no single number could express general human worth, and the entire concept of IQ as a unitary biological property becomes nonsense. This innate intelligence is usually referred to as G, or the general factor of intelligence, first identified by Charles Spearman in 1904. It remains central to Stodel's ar entire argument. Murray and Herrnstein, for instance, simply proclaim that the issue has been decided, as in this passage from their New Republic article. Among the experts, it is by now beyond much technical dispute that there is such a thing as general factor of cognitive ability, which human beings differ, and that this general factor is measured reasonably well by a variety of standardized tests, best of all by IQ tests designed for that purpose. Such a statement re represents an extraordinary degree of deception achieved by defining expert as that group of psychometricians working in the tradition of G and its avatar IQ. The authors even admit later on, page 14 through 19, that three major schools of psychometric interpretation do contend and that only one supports their view of G and IQ, the classicist as championed in the bell curve. Intelligence is structure. There are also the revisionists, intelligence is information processing, and the radicals the theory of multiple intelligence. But to even understand G, we have to delve into its theoretical basis, factor analysis. The matter received scant attention in Herrnstein and Murray's massive 800-page book, The Bell Curve, about two paragraphs. But you can't understand G without understanding factor analysis. I'll try and give you some idea of what factor analysis is, but it's not a simple concept, and you'll be best to pursue the matter independently. In brief, a person's performance on various mental tests tend to be positively correlated. That is, if you do well on one kind of test, you tend to do well on others. It shouldn't be surprising. But I should remind you that positive correlations say nothing in themselves about causes. Uh, Charles Spearman used factor analysis to identify a single axis, which he called G, that best identified the common factor behind positive correlations behind tests. I was, he was trying to figure out what, what that underlying thing was. Louis Leon Thurston, the psychometrician who developed the statistical technique of multiple factor analysis, later showed that G could be made to disappear simply by rotating the, the factor's axis to different positions. In one rotation, Thurston placed the axis near the most widely separated of attributes among tests, thus giving rise to the theory of multiple intelligences, verbal, mathematical, spatial, with no overarching G. This theory has been supported by many psychometricians, including J.P. Uh, Guilford in the 1950s, and most prominently today by Howard Gardner. 
Also consider the fact that this discovery was made in what are often referred to as the soft sciences, psychology and sociology. Among social scientists, there has always been a general envy of the physical sciences. Take Charles Spearman, an eminent psychologist, fine statistician, and the guy who discovered the so-called G-factor of general intelligence. Spearman is what we would call a reductionist. Uh, he sees you know, the externalities of the world as superficial guides, very Plato, very Platonic. Um, and if you think I'm exaggerating, Spearman wrote the following in 1923. In these principles, we must venture to hope that the so long missing, genuinely scientific foundation of psychology has at last been supplied so that it can henceforth take its due place along with the other solidly founded sciences, even physics. They could be real scientists now. Spearman goes on. Spearman called his work a Copernican revolution in point of view and rejoiced that this Cinderella among the sciences had made a bold bid for the level of triumphant physics itself. What I'm getting at is these scientists, like Spearman, like Cyril Burt, and others, had pretty strong biases in favor of reifying intelligence. That is, taking an abstract concept like intelligence and treating it as if it were a real and concrete thing. First, it pulled psychology out of the realm of pseudoscience and placed it in the realm of the physical, more respected physical sciences. Two, it provided justification for their a priori racist beliefs. So we have seen that there are three major schools of thoughts and psychometrics and that the reification of G is still hotly debated. This brings us to the next major assumption in their illogical arguments, heritability. For their theories on race and IQ to mean anything largely depends on their claims of heritability. Unfortunately, heritability is one of those words that I'm quite sure most people are going to misunderstand. And I'm going to try to explain why. There is a colloquial uh, usage of the word, the way most people would use it, uh, that a trait is genetic in nature. But when we enter the IQ race question, we're talking about heritability, we're talking about something very different. We're talking about the degree of variance within a given population for a particular trait. The concept of heritability deals with two variables, genetic and environmental. As a statistic, it is subject to a very important restriction. No two populations ever live exactly in the same environment. If a trait with a genetic component is subject to environmental effects, as most are, these effects differ in value from one environment to another. This well-known fact is largely ignored by, Pioneer Fund, by the Pioneer Fund PAC. This was explored in great depth by Eric Turkheimer from the University of uh, Virginia, who discovered that socioeconomic status modifies heritability of IQ in young children from the abstract. Results demonstrate that the proportion of IQ variants attributable to genes and envir environment vary non-linearly with SES. The model suggests that the impoverished families, 60% of the variance in IQ, 60% of the variance in IQ is accounted for by the shared environment. And the con contribution of genes is close to zero. In affluent families, the result is almost exactly the reverse. In a dramatic shift from previous findings, this analysis finds that for families at the very bottom of the socioeconomic scale, environmental factors have a much greater impact on the variations in children's IQ than genes. Put simply, once you reach a certain level of socioeconomic status, or SES, further environmental improvements don't seem to help much. But at the lower end of the SES, we see that this changes tremendously and that environment actually plays a much larger role. Just in case you really think your IQ is important, consider the 2002 study that examined the impact of non-IQ factors on income and concluded that an offspring's inherited wealth, race, and schooling are more important as factors in determining income than IQ. The inheritance of an inequality. The work of Howard Gardner and other psychometricians seriously calls into question the assertion that G, or the general factor of intelligence, is a single entity, its location within the brain quantification one number for each individual and that the use of these numbers can rank people in a single series of worthiness. Furthermore, the basic assertion that this supposedly fixed and concrete thing called G was highly heritable and little influenced by environment is being undermined by more recent research into SES at the lo so very low cool. end so of the spectrum. Therefore, there is little reason to think black-white deficit is genetic at all.